As we look here in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we're going to talk about journeying or for the holidays or traveling through the holidays. Christmas has always been one of my favorite holidays. And of course, Thanksgiving is as well. Now, of course, I love to eat. That's a big part of Thanksgiving. And I love getting stuff and giving stuff. That's a big part of Christmas. But since I've grown older, out of high school and being away from home, what I've always enjoyed about the holidays is it's an opportunity to get back with family. And maybe you're like me. I used to tell my parents I love the smell of home. And that always made them look at me weird because they didn't want their house to smell like anything. But you know what I mean. When you go back to the old home place, you get back to where you grew up, there's a, a feeling, a smell, an atmosphere that feels good to be there. When your family lives away, it feels good to, for all of us to be together. Now, with the rules this year, it's a little bit harder to travel. It's dangerous. And so you have to be careful about those sort of things. But many people will be traveling back and forth and things such as that. And so I want us to think about that and think about how that relates to what we read of here in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As we consider this, <clears throat> go ahead and think about Joseph. Here is a man who uh, was under a lot of stress, if you will. Uh, the governor has said it's time for a census, which means it's time to pay taxes. So you can imagine <clears throat> how much fun that's going to be. But not only that, now he has to go back to his home place, the city of David, Bethlehem, which is where his people are from. Now, as you read in Matthew chapter 1, you read the genealogy of Jesus. And you see where Joseph, or excuse, yeah, Joseph belongs to the family of Abraham, the family of Judah, the family of David, coming all the way through to the family of Zerubbabel. And so just 450 years before the days of Joseph, his people, his lineage, was of the king of Israel. And you can know that Joseph knew those genealogical tables, and Joseph knew where he belonged. He belonged in leadership over the entire nation. But the last 400 years have been kind of tough. As a matter of fact, and just instead of Joseph being king, now he's a carpenter. And that idea of a carpenter in our modern day would translate to a day laborer. He's somebody out making more or less minimum wage. He's someone who, as we see with the sacrifice in the temple after the birth of Jesus, as he is offering just a turtle dove, he's a man who's in poverty. And so you can imagine what's going through Joseph's mind as he realizes where he should be and now where he's at. Now he has to travel from his homeland where he, he lives all the way to Bethlehem. Now as you look on a map, and look at straight as it goes, that's 70 miles away. Jews that day used to not go through Samaria. They'd want to go through the Jordan Plain down to Bethlehem and outside of Jerusalem. And so that would be 90 miles. So here he is traveling for, let's see, us in Benton. Um, Clarksville is going to be 82 miles from here. So he is traveling from here to Clarksville on foot. And you can imagine how difficult of a journey that would be. And as he arrives, think about who Joseph is. This is his home place, if you will. This is his ancestral place. The people here are his cousins, second cousins, uncles, things such as that. But he arrives in Bethlehem, and there's not a house in the town that can take him in. There's nowhere that has room for him, even though he's among family. As a matter of fact, he even goes to the end, and the end is full, and they put him and his pregnant wife in the barn, if you will. It's more or less a cave, a place where the animals usually are, and that's where he has to stay. As you and I think about what Joseph is going through at this point, perhaps we can relate to it. For some people, holidays are tough. Sometimes we don't feel accepted or we don't feel like we fit in to our families. Sometimes because of divorce, sometimes because of separation, sometimes because of anger issues. Maybe we just don't get along with everybody, and the holidays can be a difficult time. We read in our Bibles in Psalm chapter 34, and as we look at that passage, we see a passage which perhaps 
comforted Joseph. 34.18 tells us the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted. And He is there for those who have been crushed in spirit. And so you can imagine the journey which Joseph has taken. And you can imagine what's going through his mind. But as we focus on Joseph, let's look at his wife, Mary. Now, as you think about Mary, uh, you realize what it is she's going through. When I first began preaching, I preached a sermon around Christmas and talked about Joseph and Mary and talked about Mary riding on a donkey. And somebody after services got a hold of me and corrected me. And they said, Mary never was on a donkey. That's not anywhere in there. It's a Christmas story, but it's not found in Scripture. Well, maybe she was on a donkey. Maybe not. Donkeys were pretty common back in that day. But imagine being nine months pregnant, and it's time to walk for 90 miles. Imagine knowing that you're going to have a baby in the next week or two and having to walk a four-mile journey. And as you enter around Jerusalem, around Bethlehem, there's mountains that you've got to crawl over. I looked on a weather app today. In Bethlehem, it is 52 degrees and clear, but usually the temperature is about the mid-30s. As you go through the Jordan Plain, usually during that time, it's in the mid-30s and it rains. That's the rainy season. So you can imagine walking, nine months pregnant, walking with it being cold and with it raining, walking and realizing there's really not a lot of people who are going to be anxious to see you. As a matter of fact, there may not even be a place to stay. And your minds go through what Mary is thinking about. You think she was mad at God? God, why would you make me pregnant in the winter? <laughs> why couldn't we do this during the summer? You think she was mad at Joseph? Why could I not be with one of the boys who grew up in Judea rather than having go back to Jerusalem and take this long journey? You think she was mad at the government? Why do we really have to do a census right now when all these things else are going on? There's sometimes in the holiday seasons where we're filled with grief, and we're filled with questions, and perhaps we're filled with a little bit of anger. A lot of people around us have passed away, and because of that, there's going to be some empty seats around the holiday table. A lot of us are enduring economic stress because of the pandemic and because of the economy. And sometimes as we feel this stress to give gifts and receive gifts, when we feel this stress to have big meals and to make big journeys, sometimes that causes a little bit of anger and a little bit of stress. Sometimes we look at the world and perhaps the election didn't go the way we wanted. Perhaps the news media has brought out things which make us to be kind of filled with stress. Mary very likely feels much like many people do today. Wondering why God would do the things he does in the way that he did. Psalm 46 and verse 1 tells us that no matter where we are or what we're facing, God is our refuge and strength. And he is our present help in times of trouble. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 tells us to cast our cares upon him because God cares for us. There's sometimes we don't understand why God does the things that he does. And there's sometimes that you and I would like to sit in God's seat and correct God and fix God and change God. But we receive the promise that God's with us, that God will take care of us, and that God will see us through everything that we endure. And so you can imagine Joseph. And you can imagine Mary as they journey to Bethlehem. As they travel to this place and what's going through their minds and what's going through everything that it is that they're enduring. And then the time comes and Jesus comes to this world. And as we think about Jesus, we see the very purpose of his life and his name. We read in the book of Matthew that his name will be Emmanuel which means God with us. We see that his name shall be Christ, which means anointed. We see that his name is Joshua, Yesu, the one named after the Old Testament Joshua, 
which will be the one who redeems Israel. Now, the Greek version of that name, Joshua, will be Jesus. And as you and I look at Jesus, what I want us to focus on is the journey that he made. He didn't just come from Judea, which was 90 miles away. He didn't come just across town. But he left the splendor of heaven. He came down from the presence of God, and he lived among men. We read in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, being found in appearance as a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death that would be on the cross. Now imagine with me, if you will, this aspect of the journey of Jesus. If you and I were to leave heaven, we would probably want to be born in the family of a great philosopher, or the family of an emperor, or the family of someone who would be famous, at least wealthy. And yet here is Jesus, being born in a manger being laid in a trough usually reserved for animals. Here is Jesus growing up in a poor, hardscrabble family. Here is Jesus living a life of rejection, living a life of people who turn against him, living a life where he's hungry, living a life where he is betrayed, giving himself up to die on a cross. Why? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus made the longest, greatest journey that anyone ever has, leaving the joy of heaven and living upon this earth. Why? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but he should have everlasting life. But that's not the end of the journey of Jesus. Because we see not only did Jesus come to this world to be born, come to this world to show us how to live, come to this world to die for our sins, but Jesus, after three days, was raised from the grave. Now, that's very significant. You and I as Christians oftentimes will have a cross on our necklace. We'll have a building that has a cross on the steeple. And Christianity is usually represented by a cross. But the greater representation of Christianity is not just the cross. It's an empty tomb. That's what makes it special. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we see where Adam and Eve sinned against God. And because they sinned against God, they were separated from Him, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And so we see because of that sin, there began to be hurt. There began to be struggle. There began to be sweat. There began to be guilt and regret. And eventually, through Adam, there began to be death. People are separated from those they love because of death and because of sin. Now, as we leave the building today, you can look down the road over here and you'll see a cemetery. And that cemetery is filled with good, faithful Christian members. And just about any way that you travel from here, you'll pass by a cemetery which is filled with family. You'll pass a cemetery in which brings back memories of good people who have been there. Grief hurts. Because death hurts. What makes Christianity awesome is the fact of the resurrection. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as we look here, notice what Paul says. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, and which you received, and which you also stand by which you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
Now look at verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and He was buried, and He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now skip down, if you will, to verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits for those who have fallen asleep. For by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all people be made alive. What's awesome about that empty tomb is the promise that we receive. Many times we feel like death is the end. And you'll look at a tombstone and it'll give the date of the birth and it'll give the date of the death and there is a hyphen between the two. And we see that as the beginning and we see that as the end. But it's not. Just as Christ rose from the grave, there's coming a day in which every single person shall rise from the grave. The Bible teaches clearly that there will be a physical resurrection. Now, what that will be like, we're not sure. If you're wanting to study that a little bit more, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, and read through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But we do know that the dead shall be raised. Now, there had been resurrections in the past. Elijah had raised up a widow's son. And there had been other resurrections through the Old Testament. Jesus brought back to life Lazarus and the widow of Nain's son and different people. But every one of those people, even though they came back to life, they eventually died. Jesus, when he rose, rose never to die again. And as he is the first fruit, you and I shall follow him. And everyone shall either meet the Lord when he returns or we shall rise from the grave to meet him in the air. The Thessalonian writer says, comfort one another. With these words. And so, if you deal with grief today, if you deal with sorrow today, if you deal with a tear as you have those memories today, no, it's not the end. We shall be together again. And so, it's amazing to see how this changes our life. As Paul was able to write in Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is Christ, but to die is Christ gain. But we see that's not the end of the journey of Jesus. For now we go to the ascension. And as you and I read about Jesus in Acts chapter 1, we see where he tells the apostles about how they need to preach the gospel. And then we see that he is caught up in the air and the angels appear among the apostles and they, you know, you can imagine what it'd be like. They say, what are y'all looking at? The Lord whom you saw leave shall come back in the exact same way. But now he's at the right hand of God. Why is it important to think about the ascension of Jesus? It's because, first and foremost, it shows us his authority. The person at the right hand of the king has the same power as the king. And so, therefore, you see where Jesus is able to say in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, All authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Decades later, John, in exile on the Isle of Patmos, thinking about all of his friends, the apostles, who had died a martyr's death, wondering what his future held, and being worried about the church that he loved so much, the church of Ephesus, receives a vision, an apocalypse, the revelation, a vision of his best friend, Jesus. And as he begins to see that vision, he sees Revelation 1.8, where that writing comes forth. And he says, I am the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, who is to come. I am, Jesus says, the Lord God Almighty. Jesus made a journey so that he could have authority. So he could, as an expert, tell us the way in which we need to go. But that's not the only reason why the ascension is important. We read in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 that we now have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. You and I as members of the Lord's church have an opportunity to pray. 
And when we pray through the name of the Lord, we have a direct line of communication to God. And so our journey on this earth may be difficult. And while our journey on this earth may be hard, we have one who loves us. We have one who is there for us. We have one who will never leave us nor forsake us. He's at the right hand of God. And so you and I, in the journey of which we're making, not just this week, but in the journey of our life, can see what Jesus has done for every one of us. As we look at the journey of Joseph, enduring hard times, enduring rejection, we see the message of Jesus that God will be with us. In the journey of Mary, filled with grief, filled with pain, filled with discomfort, we see that the Lord knows what we're going through, and He is there for us. Whoever you may be, whatever it may be that you're going through today, know that the Lord has made a journey for you. And know that the Lord has a journey for you to be on.